Welcome to Pitch. For this week's episode, we're going to continue our conversation with screenwriter Ed Horowitz. If you're not familiar with Ed's name, he wrote the movies On Deadly Ground, Exit Wounds, and Shark in a Bottle. He was also a writer for the TV series version of La Femme Nikita. Ed is also a playwright and is currently working on a book about screenwriting. We ended last week's episode just as Ed was about to explain to the casual listener, someone not familiar with the industry, why stories change so much from script to screen. Let's jump right in. I, I, there's so many like questions I have about, <laughs> not for myself, but for like my mom who's listening or someone who's not in the mm-hmm. industry, yeah. who goes, wait, wait, if you're the writer and you went to go see the movie, why was it so different from what you wrote? What is like a basic explanation for someone who doesn't understand the process between what you wrote and then what ends up on screen? Why things change so much? What's your mother's name? My mother's name is Jan. Jan? Jan, yeah. So Jan, you ever have a dinner party where you plan the menu, then your sister shows up and tells you you need more salt, and then your mom shows up and tells you that you need to put some sugar in it, and then Angel shows up and tells you that he's not eating meat anymore and he's not going to eat the chicken, so you got to make some fish. <laughs> that's how a movie gets changed. What happens is, okay, that's the facetious, but it, that's what happens. No, so, so it's a ton of cooks in the kitchen. Yes, but, yeah. but here's the thing. Everyone is trying to help you. They're trying. Their intentions are. They're, everyone's yeah. intent. You know, people want to badmouth executives and everybody else. And here's the truth. They are all trying to make the best, most successful movie they can. Everyone's intention, as you say, is completely good. Yeah. But they all are trying to solve the problem from how they see it. And you know that old joke about um, the blind, the five blind men who find the elephant and they're trying yeah. to figure out what it is? It's the same thing. So a producer comes in and he's trying to figure out, how am I gonna make the most money? The director's thinking, how am I gonna make this the most visually astounding movie I could ever make? The writer's trying to figure out, how am I gonna create this story and tell the story with these characters? The actor's looking for the greatest moments that he or she can play. The line producer's trying to figure out how he's gonna get it to come in under budget. And the studio's trying to figure out how they're gonna market it. And everybody's solution is different. And so. If you don't have somebody carrying the vision, Mm -hmm. it gets lost. Unfortunately, in studio Hollywood, um, writers are interchangeable. So what happens is they bring in one writer who writes, or they buy Spectrip, they bring in a writer to like fix it. And then if they they keep bringing in subsequent writers, each writer's a little bit more removed from the story than the previous writer and gets more input from these other forces as to what it should be. And so everything kind of, it's slowly, it's mission creep. It just kind of (laughs) creeps away. You know, there's so many movies I've seen where I'm like, oh, I see where this started, (laughs) you know, because they, because they do, they just, they lose focus and it, it, and then, and then you get on set and then the actor says, I've got an idea. And the studio knows that the act they need the actor to be happy to deliver the performance, so they want to accommodate the actor's needs, and so they try to incorporate those things, and those things change, and it just, and so if you're fortunate enough to be writer through the process, like you are on independent films, like your movie, Leah, mm-hmm. you know you can kind of push back and guide it. But you've got to also incorporate those ideas because you've got to keep everybody invested. All the stakeholders have to believe in the project. Mm-hmm. Or it, you, if you're the rewrite person, you try to really see through the notes to what I call the note behind the note. Mm, yeah. You know, because yeah. everybody's everybody's trying to solve the same problems, and um, everybody will give you advice. And Neil Gaiman uh, once said, "Anyone who tells you what's wrong with your script is right. Anyone who tells you what's how to fix your script is wrong." And um, the, my best version is uh, when I was in graduate school, I the meanest, most ornery teacher I ever had was a guy named Mike Gordon. And Mike Gordon had been a Broadway director and he was a B director in, um, a B movie director in Hollywood for years. And only later did I find out in life that he was, he's the grandfather of uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Hmm. Oh. And he actually took, Joseph Gordon-Levitt took Mike's last name just to honor his his legacy. I didn't know that. Oh, I found cool. that left the that's fact. Cool. But um, but Mike pulled me aside when I was leaving, and he said, uh, he said, listen, most people in this business don't know how to read a script. They'll read it. They're going to tell you what's wrong with it. They're going to be wrong. He said, but something makes it go. I don't know. He goes, respect that itch. That itch. That problem is the thing that you need to understand and solve. So I call it the note behind the note. Like what, and Mm -hmm. what I tell my students is when somebody gives you notes and you get 
feedback that you don't want to, that you don't like or that makes you uncomfortable because it's not what you hope for don't argue about it don't want to argue with them don't argue about it try to uh, get out of them what they expected because your script has created an expectation in them and if it's not what you intended this is where you've gone wrong and so that's what i i really strive to do and I, 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 there's a great example so um my writing partner and I, we sold um, at the time, my writing partner at the time, and I sold um, on Deadly Ground. It was called The Rainbow Warrior. It was a spec script. And we went to the meetings at Warner Brothers, and the studio said, the bad guy needs a son. And my, we left the meeting, and my writing partner was apoplectic because adding another <laughs> character to this story would completely screw up everything. He was 100% right. Uh, his wife was having a baby, so he, I sort of said, look, just deal with that, you know, go have your baby, and um, I'll figure something out. And I'm like, man, I do not know what to do. And I happened to be reading a biography on LBJ. And so I just made the villain a six foot six Texan in an Armani suit, 10 gallon hat and cowboy boots who barked orders at everybody. And the studio called me like, man, you nailed it. <laughs> and I got lucky. I mean, I stumbled on it. I mean, I didn't, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, I just did that. And I go, I, I hope that works. And, but that was the thing. They wanted a nemesis for Seagal that felt like he was worthy. Mm. And they thought adding another layer would make it harder to get to him. But that was not the, the solution was I had to make the villain more of a badass. Mm -hmm. So the note behind the note was we need more opposition here. We need somebody who's, yeah, we, what the real note behind those, we need Seagal to feel more like an underdog. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But the, and the thing is, but they, the way they tried to solve it is from their capacity and ability to fix a script. Well, well, you know, they get the script, mm -hmm. they read the script. The meeting set for next week, they now have to read 25 other scripts and all these other projects and they have to come with a solution. They don't have the time to ponder, so mm, they don't yeah. really, they just know something's wrong in their gut yeah, and yeah. then they try to give you what they think is their solution and they're trying to be helpful. Yeah, yeah. And if you take that note to heart and do that note, it becomes your choice and now it's your fault. <laughs> I was listening to, I forget if it was um, The Screenwriter's Life or if it was Script Notes recently, they were talking about how they receive notes and how they interpret notes. And this woman had worked at an agency and had been a witness to the process of a writer getting notes from a producer and doing all of the notes and turning the script back into the producer. And the producer's like, they just wrote what I told them to write. Why did they do that? Right. So this producer was used to writers mm -hmm. interpreting and getting the note behind the note without it being a direct graft of the notes. Yes. And he was like, no, actually more than that. He was relying on that. He was relying yeah. on a writer to take what his idea was, knowing that his idea was not probably the right one and that the writer would then take and apply his craft to figure it out. It's, you know, again, I said at the beginning, I'm an ASCAP songwriter. So I play in, I play in a band at the moment and we do a bunch of original songs. I, I write most of them. And what's the name of the band? Well, this band is this new band has no name. We don't know yet. We cannot agree on a name. Um, okay. The band that people would know, you won't know the band, but they were, we were called the Jonah Kiss. We had a bunch of songs on like Party of Five back in the 90s. Oh, cool. And we had a song in the movie Meet Wally Sparks. And we had a couple of, you know, what happened was because I was a writer in Hollywood, I knew a lot of people. And our, our singer was a writer in Hollywood. So our friends would come and they'd be, hey, can I put the song, you know, in, as a temp track? And people would go, this is good. Let's use it. <laughs> and then they started paying us. We're like, okay, we're making a living. We'll keep doing this. But, um, but what I was gonna say is so like, I'll write a bass line and then I'll give it to my bass player and I'll say, okay, make it good. Yeah, yeah. And nine out of 10 times, what comes back is beyond what I could have envisioned. And I'm like, oh my God, this genius. He's like, well, I just did what you told me, but it's not. Yeah. He's filtered it through his talent and his ability and he's come up with something that's more, because I'm not a bass player, I'm a guitar player. So, I mean, that's, and that's, and, and the reality is this business is, when it works, it's collaborative. When it works, yeah. that's, I mean, when it works, actors take your words. And I mean, I more than theater, but in movies too. And I'm like, I wrote this? This is me? How, this is, I, I didn't write this because these actors have imbued it yeah. with like specificity and life and details. And then great directors will frame it and put it up. And you're like, this is amazing. That doesn't happen too often because as I like to say, takes a hundred people to make a great movie. It takes one person to ruin it. 
You know, I mean, it, all it takes is the craft services person For to have real. salmonella. Yeah. You know, or to have the flu one day and, and the movie goes to shit. Yeah. And yeah. it's not everybody's fault. But so, you know, that's it. But theoretically, it is a collaborative. I mean, business. I mean, theater. Even if it's a one person show, you need an audience. It's a collaboration. Yeah. You need to do previews. You need to get the feedback. You need to test, which is basically gauging an audience's like reaction to what you're doing. Yes. And you need an audience to watch it. Yeah. You're not just doing it in a vacuum. Yeah, acting alone in your room is not acting. It's delusion. <laughs> That's some of the best acting on the planet, though, man. Some of the best acting on the planet has been done in front of a mirror without a camera or an audience there. Well, if you're doing it in front of a mirror, you are your own audience. Touche. I would say, you know, some of the best singing ever done has been done in the shower. But, but that's nobody... because of the humidity. It opens up the pipes. Exactly. They've that's, proven that. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly <laughs> what it is. No, but, it, but that's the thing. It's like, you know, like um, uh, my cousin, um, who's an artist, who's been an artist for 60 years, she was friends with Andre Previn. And we were talking about this one day and she was having dinner with Andre Previn. Um, people tell me he's a famous violinist. Yeah, famous, famous violinist back in the day. Um, she said, Andre, who's the most important, por- most important person in the audience? And he said, I mean, the most important person in the uh, orchestra. And he said, the audience. Yeah. Because otherwise, who are you playing for? Hands down. That was the first thing I learned in drama in high school. That the audience is most important? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because who are you doing it for? We've, t- we've talked about this before. Yeah. I want to go back in the process, earlier in the process. Wait, can I ask one question? Yeah, of course. Did you learn that from John Irving? I wish. <laughs> okay, no. just checking. All right. Mr. Back in McGough. the process. Uh, Mr. McGough was this yeah. a professor. Of Ms. Oh, no, Ms. no, he her drama teacher. My drama teacher. Drama teacher. Mr. McGough in high, in high school. Yeah. Wow. Um, yes, sir. Process. How do you decide if an idea is worth pursuing to full to make a full script of it? Like, say a student has three ideas. How do you suggest that student vet the three ideas and say, "Hey, look, this is the one you write because of A, B, and C." Oh, that's a great question. Um, and that's exactly what we did last week because the class just started. Oh, great. And we're doing it again this week. I'm um, currently in this dilemma right now. I've got five ideas. That they're all like, great. That I've been pitching and testing with friends. And I'm like, how do I, what would you well, say? Well, I'll say, and then why don't you pitch them and we'll, we can talk them out. I'm being dead serious. Yes. Okay, great. great. Um, okay. We'll so first thing is, I want to know, is there a concept? Mm, okay. Is there a character? And... What is the story engine that's going to destru- that's going to drive the show? And the story engine is where is the conflict? And if the conflict is easily resolved, re- res- resolvable, or is not going to sustain, or the characters want and their growth is limited, you don't have an engine that's going to drive the show for two or three seasons. Um, so what happens is I get students who pitch really great ideas and don't know the character. I get char- students who pitch great characters and don't know what the conflict is. Mm-hmm. And, and so I'll give you some examples. So a woman in my class, she pitched a great idea. Or actually, she pitched a great character, I should say. She wants to do a show about a seven-year-old woman who becomes the number one performer on OnlyFans. <laughs> okay, instant awesome. laugh. Instant laugh. Instant laugh. And I said, what's the conflict? And the pitch was over. Yeah. And somebody in class said, what if she were a nun? There's that, the conflict. That's not what the woman wants to do, but that's a show. Yep. See, you smile. There's the conflict. You can't see Angel just smile and Leah just smiled. You, you can feel it maybe in the podcast. But they, because now you see, you see, okay, she's contradicting her own set of values. Yeah. There's going to be a reason why she's doing it that's going to be for the convent or something. She's got to keep it a secret. Mm-hmm. There are stakes. Mm-hmm. personal and professional and heavenly um and it's ironic and funny so that you know so so i don't know where she's going to go she's going to come back and figure that out next week um another guy pitched the show i want to real quick about sure. that idea so you haven't spoken about a real world like um a real connection to the a connection to the world we currently live in as a part of this story creating matrix yet but in that idea that you just talked about, that does exist because we are currently in the social media era where OnlyFans is this rising phenomenon. And now in this idea that you just talked about, there's potentially a nun who is the number one only, right? So that, so the, us in the real world who are dealing with OnlyFans, TikTok, Instagram, we have a connection to that. So is that part of what you suggest your students say? What do you want to say about the world we live in today? Or is that not necessarily part of what you're doing? No, that's a brilliant comment. And um, that is part of it. And I should okay. have said that. No, I, one of the things I make them do is when they pitch their idea, because they have to turn in their ideas 
for this next week, I make them write a sentence or two about why they want to tell this story and why the story should be told. That's key. Okay, and yeah, that's key. And you're is. right. And that's now there are two things. I, I should have said that, and you're completely right. And thank you for bringing that up. Um, yes, you've got to. You've got to say something. Your show's got to say something because you've got to speak to the zeitgeist. And, you know, both commercially and just socially and globally. And the best shows do that in a unique way. And that is essential. And it's also got to be your point of view. You have to have a point of view as the writer. And you've got to have something to say. Otherwise, why should we care? Yeah. And that's that's the big question that I spoke with a writing mentor of mine, and he was like, what do you want to say about the world? Start with that and then come up with a concept. So it's just an order of operations difference. Okay, that's that's a great note. Um, I agree. I often, when people, when people come in and they don't know what they want to write, I say, well, figure out what do you want to write about? I say, I ask them, do you, who do you want to write about or what do you want to say? Mm-hmm. Because they're the same. If you know what you want to say, you can figure out who are the people you need to populate that idea with to say it. And sometimes we have an idea, oh, I wanna write a show about a singing dog. We don't know why, but something is in us, there's an impulse to create that character for some reason. And now we have to work backwards to what you're saying, which is why do I wanna talk about this character today? But they're both essential. And um, you know what I try to tell people is that whenever you write, a a dramatized story, which is what a script is, right? Anything with a ca- with characters in conflict, it's a drama. It's essentially a formal argument. You're writing, a th- you're saying, my main character represents a value set that I believe should exist in the world. This is my thesis for how the world should be. My antagonist represents how I perceive the world to be that I think should change. This is my antithesis. And at the end, when there's a resolution to this story, we have the synthesis of how I wish the world were. And if you can figure that out, then you know what you can say, what you well, want to say. Well, let's figure out if Angel's figured it out. So do you want to pitch one, Angel? Um, yeah, let's, let's pitch one. Uh, give, me, give me just a second here to think of which one I want to pitch. Okay. Well, he has a really cool... Do you, can I go through some of them so we're not dead silence? Well, I can just edit it out. <laughs> The um, magic of technology. So okay, so here's here's I think the one that's the most primal, and it's also the newest idea I have. Okay, I always tell my students never apologize, never explain. Just tell me what it is. Also, and don't tell me, don't talk me into not liking it. Gotcha. It. So it's the rules of dating, also. So we've got we've got a we've got a strong history of pretty pretty powerful superheroes. Can I stop you, Angel? Yeah. Okay. When you pitch it, tell me a story. Okay. Do you have a title? I got a title. What's it called? All American Killer. All American Killer. Yeah. Ooh, ironic. I'm already interested. I'm being serious. I'm not being facetious. I'm All American Killer. Okay. All American Killer. What's the concept? The concept is that there is a Terminator-esque figure and there is no one to stop them. But there will be stereotypical heroes traditional white savior types who we think will be able to stop this individual they will not this one individuals this all-american killer their plan is to go through and kill everyone on the planet one by one kind of like the terminator kind of like no country for old men okay let me ask you some questions is this set in the future no it's set in like two months okay so it's, it's the near future so it's, yeah. it's like science faction we'll yeah yeah we're not we're not years we're okay months does this killer have a, does he, is it a he or she? It's a he. And it's he presents he. Okay. initially as a shooter. Does he, is he a person or yeah. is he a yeah, it's cyborg? A, it's, no, it's a person. Okay. So it's not, so it's not a Terminator character. It's, it's, a, it's an assassin. I'm, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of there being some invincibility. Like in the horror tropes where a community has cr- sinned and created a monster, this would be the American community's monster that's come to life. Okay. You're, you're. This is all good, but you're thinking way outside the box in terms of the characters in the world, and yeah. I would advise you to think inside it. So who's your main character? Um, I think the killer is my main character. So we are supposed to be rooting for a guy who's going to single-handedly kill everyone in the world. I think that's the, that's the dump on the head of traditional horror films, yeah. Why are we going to care about this character? 
And why are we going to root for this guy? I mean, that's a great question. I don't have that sorted out yet. Okay. Well, then you don't have a show because sure. we have to be rooting for something. What are we rooting for? Are we rooting for people to stop him? Or are we rooting for him to succeed? We're rooting. I, I think it's, I think, again, I'm still working out. I think we're rooting for the stereotypical heroes to step in and stop him. And every time they fail, it's another, it's another step closer to the realization that this is an unstoppable thing we've brought upon ourselves. What can we do then? Okay. So you've got a really interesting idea. What happens if there's an unstoppable killer, not unlike a virus, maybe? Sure, or yeah. Or a nuclear war or a few of these other dystopian things? So you're kind of doing a dystopian futuristic story. To a yeah. Certain, I mean, it's, it's, it's contemporary. The road, it's the road to dystopia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You've got to find a character that your audience, your viewer, your reader mm -hmm. wants to root for and wants to invest in because it's not going to be this killer if, unless the killer's got an unbelievable sense of humor that we okay. find really funny. So what you've got is you've got this really great idea and you want to, and what are you trying to say? Like in your head, like what is it that this taps into for you? Um, I think we, we've, we've passed kind of a tipping point with humanity with how we're treating each other. So all we can, the best thing we can hope for now is to run and hide and just to wait our turn. And I know that's not a very optimistic, like positive I movie ending type idea but i have an interjection because we worked on um the physical film set and we were talking about the same article on the same day which is when society comes to a certain point mm -hmm. and all of the intelligent people decide that the world is better off if everybody jointly commits suicide do you okay. remember this i'm not i have no recollection it's like of this. self self de self-destruction for the preservation of something greater than you okay so what if this killer has come to that point but nobody else is caught up to them and so they force everybody else onto the value system that they have i mean i that that seems like plausible I, the where i'm at with this and this is only a couple weeks old this idea i'm not necessarily trying to do a lot of mythology like it, mm. it's like kind of a visceral thing right now right okay sorry i didn't mean to cut you no off. please oh. please by um, all means but here's the thing two things one is it's a concept sure it's yeah. not a show yeah. No, I'm it's thinking a movie. I'm thinking movie. No, I was going to say, okay, well, we were talking about TV shows. I was going about to say, it sounds like a close-ended story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how are you going to kill everyone in the world? I mean, that, I mean. That's a slow march. <laughs> I mean, or, or it's not, or he's Putin. Yeah. You know, and he yeah, just yeah. is going to say screw and he's going to start unloading weapons on the Ukraine and get the world into a nuclear war and everybody's going to get wiped out. I mean. It's a much more difficult task if they don't have access to nuclear weapons. But, okay, but there's so, but, okay, but you know, you say you don't want to create a mythology, but you have to create a mythology that makes sense for why is this guy unstoppable? Like, yeah, utterly, yeah. Un like, there's a lot of stuff. What you, again, it's a really great idea, but you haven't found the humanity in the story yet. You haven't found the characters that are going to articulate the ideas you want to say. Because it's like, if the thing is, we just have to run and hide and wait until it's our turn, there's no conflict in that story. The story's got to be about somebody who wants, if, if, if your main, if you're, let's call him the main character for the moment, if your main character wants to just kill everybody, yeah. the antagonist wants to live. Yes. But your audience is then intuitively going to root for that person. Because wanting to live is the human condition. And that's fine. Right. But so that's your story. So how is your story not Terminator? And I don't mean that. I mean, which is no, one is, of my favorite this, movies of all time. Yes. But the greatest the line question. in that movie is, come with me if you want to live. And I don't, th I, I think that is, an, that is an innate human flaw. Hope <laughs> and survival and just like, just the propagation of the species. I think that's a that's a biological drive that we've assigned meaning to that is causing our environment to break down and our ability to be sustained in that environment. And I think people, not enough people are paying attention to that. So it's kind of like we're only going to die of our own arrogance, so we might as well take our time, but we're still going to become a damaged species as a result of our own actions. Wow. So we want to survive. Our stories want to have hope and we want to survive, but like... I'm trying to figure out a way to dump that on its head and be like, well, isn't that sort of the last of us? Um, I haven't watched it and I'm not familiar with the, the TV show. Neither have I. I haven't either. I know so about we're... the fungus, that but everybody talks though. about it. 
But um, did you see Station Eleven? No, I didn't see. Did you see Silo? Didn't see Silo. No. I mean, these are all kind of these dystopian future things, and in them, it's always one person wants to like survive or know the truth, or Mm -hmm. but and but I I think that I mean I, I. I agree with everything you're sort of saying, but in, in the most, you two are some dark individuals. I just want to add, you know, you're talking about, what did you say? Everybody's going to kill themselves. <laughs> like When society comes to a certain point, they realize it's, it's a tipping point of if we continue yeah. to survive, we destroy everything. So they jointly agree to commit suicide. But, but the thing is, is that that is not the human condition. What's not the human condition? to accept our mortality. It never has been. I know, and I want to say maybe some of us should. I had an argument with a guy. I had an argument with a guy, and he was like, we should go to Mars. I was like, why should we go to Mars? He goes, because we're fucking humans. We should populate the, 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 the cosmos. And I'm like, we can't even manage the environment we developed in without polluting it to our detriment. And you think we deserve, just by thinking that, that we deserve to go to Mars and populate that planet? Well, I would argue that he should go to Mars. <laughs> He's a great guy. He's pretty young. But I was like, this is the, this is the sort of like blind, like, well, we're humans. So, of course, we're, we're never, okay. we can do no wrong. And I'm like, we can do wrong. We have done wrong. No one's stopping the wrongdoing. What cost do we have to pay? This is a manifestation of the okay. cost. So, okay, but so like, going back to your pitch, let's talk about that. So, but you're talking about two very human realities, humility and mm-hmm. hubris. Yeah. So this guy represents hubris mm-hmm. and you're talking about people in a world that are all full of their own hubris and they, th- they think that they've got it figured out and they're destroying the world. I mean, this is a perfect metaphor for what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, but the, and the flip side of that is somebody who fights that with humility because you're, we want what you're really saying behind your, your facade of dark cynicism mm-hmm. in those like, you know, you know, soap opera pretty eyes of yours is, um, beautiful eyes is, um, no, is a belief you want to tell a story because you believe that the world should that people should strive to be better and should actually be humble and yes. do things right. So yes. you need to articulate that, but, but so, they have not. It is too late. It is no, no. Okay, but, but yes, yes, but, yes. Okay, you're but, absolutely right. But, yeah. Okay, but that's that's your story. It's about somebody who's trying to save the planet and fighting against the inevitability that mm-hmm. it's too late. That's the human condition that's underneath your idea. And I'll give you two examples, one old and one new. You ever see Sil- uh, Silent Running? I think it's, yeah, Silent Running? Mm-mm. No. Bruce Stern, in like 1972, okay. is on a spaceship. It's the last plot of Earth left. And he's got three guys, and they're like forest rangers. And the other three guys just run their ATVs and are trashing the ground, so he kills them. And then it's just him and his three little robots, Chewie, Dewey, and Louie. And they are trying to preserve what's left of Earth. And then I can't remember exactly what happens, but they basically hit like a, like a space storm, and they all die. Okay. And it's about the last guy who wants to save the earth. 1972, very dark ending. You can do that. You can't do, I mean, you can do that today, but it commercially, nobody wants to make that. So there's sure, a movie yeah. that's coming out. Oh, it came out actually this week about a guy aging, filled with humility, trying to stop an inevitable, faceless entity that wants to wipe out everything we know. It's called Mission Impossible. It's about a guy with humility who's trying to save the world. And whether he can pull it off or not, we don't know because it's a two-parter. But do you see? So uh, you're on an idea that's that's tapping into the correct zeitgeist, but you framed it from this intellectual idea and didn't get into how can I tell this story in a way that will like connect on a human level with the audience. It's also tough. I want to do the inverse of it though. But why? You want to do that only because you just want to like poke the bear. Sure, yeah. But that, yeah, but, but here's the thing. It's called show business. And yeah. so you have to create an entity that's got commercial viability. So the key is to tell your story in a way that conveys your idea yet is palatable and convincing to, you know, the audience. You know, On Deadly Ground, the Rainbow Warrior that, that we wrote was about a guy who put out oil well fires in Alaska and... Um, finds out that this oil company is going to build a, a well on the North Slope and they know it's going to blow, but 
but they need to get it up and running to get a completion deal that gives them 99 years of lease on the land. So they're like, fuck it, we'll blow it up. We'll have an oil spill, we'll clean it up, and 10 years from now, we'll still reap 80 years of, of benefit. Yeah, yeah. And we'll just destroy the North Slope of Alaska. And this guy tries to stop it, and they leave him for dead on the North Slope. And he's found by this group of atavistic Eskimos that are led by a guy who was on a bender and had this vision of the future. And this small band of, Nat- of Inuit, Native Alaskans, are living the old ways and they find him and they think he's this mythic figure who's going to (laughs) save the planet to which he says i don't care if you think i'm the easter bunny i have to get back and deal with this and then he ends up basically coming back and they stop the thing from blowing up and then he heals himself and he goes away and everybody lives happily ever after. Now, we had to take it out of the snow. It became Steven Seagal, the native Alaskan who was supposed to be this. I mean, literally, we were sort of doing um, a cross between uh, what we told ourselves when we wrote it was we wanted to do Lawrence of Arabia in the snow and we wanted the, the native Alaskan to be uh, the chief in um, Little Big Man. The one who said, it's a good day to die. Yeah. And like all that got thrown out the window. They said, take it out of the snow and make it Joan Chan because Seagal doesn't work with a partner. <laughs> And so we did. But the thing is, and this, the movie became this action nonsense that sort of lost its way. But at the end of the day, it's about a guy trying to stop an oil company from polluting the environment. So you can root for that. So you can tell your story and express the ideas and the values and the themes you want. But you have to, you have to seduce your audience into eating that meal. You can't force it down their throats because we're in a subjective business. They sure. won't watch it. Yeah. And that's the job. So the job is to be angry and then put a smile on it and use the anger to motivate what you do, but you've got to sell it. I have two things. First thing is you didn't pitch the tone. You didn't pitch the tone of the show. So I think it's in my mind, I can see it where the people that he's killing deserve to die. And it's a high comedy because they're just awful human beings. Or it's just very, very dark. And you discover that these people deserve to die by the drama that they bring onto themselves. Gotcha. But my second thing is, we were going through, what should you write next? Yeah, so... And I think, uh if I'm your manager, that your indigenous script... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And that's why I kept asking the question, like, how to determine what you write, because... Of yeah. that one idea, I've got four others, and we're not going to get into it. But I'm like, which one do I? Which one do I spend the next six months on? Yeah, I would argue not that one. Fair enough. I, only because I mean, I would say keep thinking about it, but I think you sure, need to yeah. turn around your head until you find your way into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to say one other thing um, along with what Lee was saying. Scope. The scope of that's way too big. You can't kill everybody in the planet. It's just it, you can't do it in a you you can't do it in ten seasons. You know, it needs to be much smaller. You know, that could be a same idea about a handful of you know you know, environmentalists go camping and there's sure. somebody out there to do it. I mean, there's a thousand ways to do yeah, it. Yeah, but see, that they, stuff's been done. And it's the reason it's been done is because that's the way to do it. And I'm, again, in the in, for the intellectual exercise, I'm like, how do I set something in motion that is inevitably going to take us all out? Which is terrifying. And we just came out of COVID, which is kind of like a reaction to that, right? Well, that's what all these, that's what all these dystopian shows are. Mm-hmm. They are reaction. But, yeah, but, but they're all after, after the fact, right? Like, have we seen the process? And I, I'm, I'm also huge well, into Well, Station like, 11, st- I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, Station 11 starts before the panic. Oh, does it really? It okay. starts like literally like as the, the pan, as the pandemic hits and everyone dies. And you see the first, I think, three episodes of that. And then it jumps to like 20 years later. And, and it's, like a, it's it. a virus in that? It's a virus, yeah. yeah. Um, but what were you, there was something, you, oh, but, but what you said was, you said, but the, you said something about the intellectual argument you wanted to make. And here's the thing. Nobody goes to a story for the intellectual argument. Nobody goes to a movie or a novel, right? I mean, they, they go for the humanity, and so it doesn't mean you can't have the intellectual idea, but you have to dress it up or hide it behind the human condition and sure. the human needs. It's, that's why it's all about the character. Yeah. Uh, I think Cabin in the Woods is a good example of that. Yeah, I never saw it, but yeah. So Cabin in the Woods was dressed up as a, True Goddard. a, a pretty standard horror film. And then the, like, the intellectual design behind that, you're like, oh, shit. That was what was so cool and kind of like popped about that because it was intellectually acknowledging all the horror tropes and then giving them an explanation that we'd never seen before. Yeah. It was, was the last meta horror movie. It was pretty fantastic. I age. mean, um, yeah. Terminator, you know, came out 25 years ago and we are living in a Cameronian, Cam, 
cam Cameronian dystopian reality. <laughs> but like, what if there was a Terminator who didn't just have one target? Like, that's the question, and we deserved it. Yeah, but the problem is, is that it's too diffuse. What do we? Who are we identifying? What are we caring about? We don't. We don't care about faceless people. We care about the people in a story that we um, that we emo- empathetically and emotionally bond with. You need people that you care about. So, and so if it's a, a movie with like everybody dies, well, I'm like. I don't know those people down the street. All right. So what about No Country for Old Men then? What about it? I mean, who do we care about in that? We care about Tommy Lee Jones. Okay. We care about uh, James Bro- Bro- Is it James Brolin? Brolin. Or Josh Brolin. Which one? James. It's Josh. Josh. Josh Brolin, yeah. We care about Josh Brolin. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's kind of a dunderhead. He tries to pull something off and get away with something. Yeah, Because right? yeah. he wants to like make his girlfriend happy. Yeah. But he, he does it because wife, girlfriend, I can't remember. It's been so long. But he gets the money and he wants the money because he wants to like, run away with his girlfriend or go away with his girlfriend. So yeah. his intention is good. Yeah, and yeah. we can root for that. But his method methodology is completely misguided. Yeah. And he pays a price for that. And then on the other side Tommy Lee Jones is a man living in a world that he no longer understands and he's trying to find a way to cope and most of us live in a world that we don't understand what's going on and we can identify with that struggle so you've got two people and weirdly that's humility and hubris Mm -hmm. right and then you've got reality in the face in the form of like a bull cutted you know you know assassin yeah yeah killing everybody and we like him because he is basically completely self-aware. This is why we like villains. We love villains because they are self-aware, right? It's like Chinatown is my favorite villain. Like when um, John Houston says, unlike everyone else, I know that I'll do whatever I want in the moment if I feel like it. And then, he, and then in the script, I don't remember if it's in the movie, he bends down and puts his face right to a pile of stinking cow poo and goes, do you smell that? That's life, you know? And like... <laughs> And, you know, he's, he's, we love the Alan Rickman in yeah. Die Hard. We yeah. love that guy because that guy knows exactly who he is and does not apologize. And again, the human condition is we are not that self-aware. We all are embarrassed about things or we have regrets. Like, why did I say this? Why did I do that? And these guys don't. It's like, why do we love Sam Jackson? Because he's always talking about how he doesn't care about those motherfucking snakes on that motherfucking plane. <laughs> and he just... Does he just he just does Sam Jackson, and we love him for that. That's yeah. why we love Tom Cruise. And you brought up a very interesting point, which is what drives character is you're pitting a sin against a virtue, and at different points during their story, they are closer to one or the other. That yeah, I mean you know I always say that usually all good villains embody some one of the seven sins, and one of and good char- main characters all basically embody more, at least one of the seven virtues. And if you can distill it down to one. People, people often feel like they don't want to be simplistic when like in my class and I have to explain to them, it's not simplistic. You have to distill it down to one. It doesn't mean that's the only one, yeah. but if there's a Zen simplicity, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I have students who always say, oh, I'm like, well, what does your character want? They're like, yeah, I don't want to state it. It's too obvious. I'm like, Wizard of Oz, I want to go home. Star Wars, I want to be a Jedi Knight. Chinatown. Someone fuck with me and I want to know why. It's like your characters state exactly what they want. In a good movie, there's so it's so rich with detail that you don't feel as if it's being you're being bludgeoned over the head. Yeah. But it's there. Movies are not subtle. The Matrix. I, think, I want to know what the Matrix is. I recently listened to Am Charlie. I the one? Am I the one? Am I yeah. the one? That's it. I recently listened to Charlie Day talk about It's Always Sunny and the question was how do you get an audience to like such unlikable characters in that show because they're pretty absurdist characters? He goes, at the very beginning of every episode, every character has a very defined want. And the audience will come on board as long as they know what that character wants. Correct. And you doggedly pursue that as a character. I think one of the things, because it's such a new pitch that you're giving, Angel, I think one of the things is the reason. And that's missing. Yeah, and like I said, this is this idea is two weeks old versus yeah, it's other very ideas. fresh. No, it's like, okay. It's, you know, we're, we're not coming down there. I, it, there's there's definitely something in there, but you haven't found. I mean, uh, what I was gonna say is there's something in there you haven't found. I, I wrote a, a horror movie about yay four or five years ago. Yeah, not you know, I'm not as skilled at it as others in the room. Um, I, I pitched a TV show to this company, and it was it was vet related. Okay. And um, veterinarian medicine or no, veteran no, vet, military okay. vet. It was a company that they're gone now. They were called um, uh, 
I can't remember the name of what they were called, but they were basically, they were a, a film company, they were a streaming company that made content geared towards military and their families because that's like, you know, several million people in America. Mm -hmm. It's a huge audience. Yeah, huge. So um, I pitched a TV show and they, they came back and they said, you know what, we don't really see it as a TV show, would you write it as a movie? I'm like, yeah, but I'm not a horror guy. So we had a bunch of meetings and I made a list of about 20 horror movies and I went, I watched every one of them and I broke them down because the thing, if you want to be a writer, you know, you know, you have to know structure. Yeah. And if you break down 20 movies in the same genre, you will see that the same kinds of things happen at the same point. So once I had that, I knew how to do it. And then we worked on it, we worked on it and things were right and things were not. And um, I worked very closely with the, the, the head of development and there was sort of the guy who was the president above him. And the president began to sort of lose interest, uh, lose faith in the idea. And um, the head of development said to me, he goes, one day he goes, I don't think we have a movie here. And I said, no, we just haven't found it yet. And I said, let me do one more pass. And uh, I did the last pass and he's like, yeah, you were right. Cause like, it's finding, you have to find your movie. Yeah. You know, this is what happens. People, you know, especially, and that's what I think people who make a living understand is like, Sometimes you have to do 35 drafts to find it if you believe in it. It goes back to your question of how do you know what movie to write? The way I do it is what am I compelled? It really comes down to what compels me. That's that, It's that simple. If I work on an idea, like I, like I have a play that I wrote three years ago. It got some interest. I got notes on it. I think I'm going to go back to it next week. I don't know. It's like it's been three years. I'm like, because uh, I haven't been able to either find my way into it or I'm not sure I want to. But with a feature it's, or a TV show, it's when I, I really believe in the idea and I want to realize that idea. And producers, directors, actors, they will lose faith in it. But writers will stick with that idea. So oh, it's yeah. like, so I mean, so the the lazy answer to your question is, I write the thing that I can't not write because it's just there and I have to make sense out of this. I mean, I like I've written a, I wrote a pilot and I, I have one friend, she's a TV producer. I've known her for 40 years, 45 years. She reads everything I write and she gives me the most honest feedback ever. And I wrote, she goes, it's great. There's no story. You'll never sell it. <laughs> and she wasn't right, but I was like, you know, she's not completely wrong. Okay, I got it out of my system. I'm good with that one. But then I had another script where I did that, and she gave me that same note, and I was writing, and I was like, I said to my partner on this, I, this one was with partner. I'm like, no, she's right, but we're going to fix it. We're going to find it. And we did, and we wrote like eight more drafts. And, you know, now we're on strike, but it's in some competition, and we actually got a note from some other person who read it. It was like, this thing's amazing. But it's, who knows if it's amazing? But the thing is, is that we did not let it die because we were compelled to find the real story in it. So that's how you decide. That's I, how I decide. I love that. That's I, that's super helpful. It's the thing you just keep coming back to. Yeah. Because the ones you're not compelled, you'll let fall by the wayside. Yeah. I want to go back and just say thank you for sharing your idea and what I, and agreeing to being on sort of a chopping block with it. <laughs> but Yeah, what that's I, really brave. That's really brave. What I love about it is I know because I've seen your process in writing through several um, stories and through th reading several scripts of yours at mm -hmm. different points in time is I really trust your process. So wherever you are now with this very fresh two week new idea, mm -hmm. if it is something that like he said, you're compelled to write it and you can't shake the idea from your head among all the other great ideas, the five that you have going on there is I know that you're going to find it if you stick with it. No, well, thank, thanks for saying that. I appreciate that. It's really, really nice of you to say. And yeah, no, that's really important. And, and that's really important because that's one, something I tell my students because, you know, my students will get stuck. They'll get blocked and they will panic. They'll want to quit. They'll want to change their ideas. Act two. Act, you, the middle of act two, actually. It's, yeah. no, no, I really honestly believe this, that everybody panics at exactly the middle of whatever length the script is you're writing. If you're writing a 30-minute script, you <laughs> panic on page 15. If you're writing an hour <laughs> script, you panic on 30. If it's a two-hour script, you panic on page 60. Because as my friend, who's a writer, said... The midpoint is when you're as far from the shore as you are from the destination, <laughs> you and you realize you back. don't know which way it makes the sense. But but what I want, but what you just said is spot on because what I tell my students is you're panicking right now, and I said the difference between you and me is I've done this enough that I have empirical data to know that if I keep going, I will be okay, and you don't know that yet, and that's the difference between um, new writers. And season writers yeah. is the faith that their craft will get them through to the end. And this goes back to the thing about drive that 
that, well, there are two things. What I tell my students, when I make them do my classes, I make them outline ad nauseum. And they go, but when are we going to start writing? And like, this is writing. The, the, the ideation is the writing. Those are this, the first drafts. Well, those are the first dozen drafts you're doing. At least. Those, yeah. yeah, the script is just the presentation, but you've yeah. got to get the idea right. Yeah. And I said, if you, get, if you write your outline and you double check it and rewrite it and triple check it and you believe in your outline, when you panic, because you will, just keep writing your outline. Don't try to change things. Yeah. Don't try to fix it. Fix it when it's done. Get to the end of your draft because until you're done, you do not know what you have. I think one of the yeah. Yeah. one of the character traits that all writers have in common, and maybe I'm being idealistic here, but you were telling a story about telling your father that you were going to go to school and you were going to be a writer, you were going to be a playwright, you were going to go yeah. into scripts, and his answer to you, yeah. you ignored, because you had this level of personal faith, and I think it's that level of personal faith that buoys you past that midpoint crisis. And I think it's I think it's inherent almost because we're going to move past it and we're going to drive towards what we think is the end of whatever the story is going to be. So it's this commonality between all of us that we have that despite seeing the blank page and the crisis on the page, we're going to move past it and we're going to fight and we're going to grind. I, I completely agree. There are two there are two aspects of that. Um, there's a thing called and yep, we're pulling the rug on you for this episode. We'll finish our chat with Ed in our next episode and get to hear his thoughts on Leah's breakdown of what all writers have, along with some other great takes. On behalf of Leah and myself, thanks for listening. Cheers from Hollywood. If you're on the fence about subscribing, know that a portion of all subscription fees go toward the nonprofit Young Storytellers, raising voices one story at a time. We here at Pitch support and stand in solidarity with the members of the WGA and everyone supporting their current fight for fair compensation and their rightful place in the future of film, television, and streaming content production. Head over to WGA.org to find out more and how you can support as well.